said, Ronnie, I got to tell you something. Your father's dead. It was not a robbery. And there were good licks. I mean, somebody is against him. Rental properties, evictions, repos, anything that anyone could. Inches of any type. And you to pound. I, she kept her phone clean. There were no odd calls. The defendant is guilty of doing the state's case. In love with Melvin. Station style is unlike most people. Weird was something to open the jury up to. She might be weird, she might be inconsistent, but look, you know, she's not a killer. The defense also reminded the jury Julia was a victim. She'd been attacked. And as she told police, there was a perfectly good reason why that duct tape was loose. And if the tape hadn't got way up to the ray, I don't know if I'd have gotten off. But wouldn't it have still pulled some, some skin or some hair? It was raining the night of the incident. So as it's raining, it's getting wet, it's not sticking as much as it usually does. And since it was raining that night, the prosecution had asked, why wasn't Julia wet and muddy? Easy, the defense said. She was. On the video, you can see her jeans are soaking wet. She's not dry. She's got mud all over her pants, <clears throat> which was from the rain and the dirt. The defense also addressed the gunshot residue found on Julia's clothes, which seemed to undermine her story that she was behind a wall, 60 feet away from where the gun went off. Julia's lawyer argued that it wasn't a residue found on Julia's clothes. Finally, the defense had to counter the heart of the prosecution's case motive. The state claimed Julia feared she was about to be dumped and written out of Melvin's will. But her lawyer said they were still a happy couple. Just look at the lingerie Julia was wearing and the booze she brought with her that night. She picked up Mike's hard lemonade and went to meet Melvin at the house on her birthday. This was supposed to be a hot, steamy night. <laughs> and the idea that Julia was broke and needed Melvin's money, also not true, said the defense. Julia's lawyer argued her family had plenty of money and was willing to spend it. Her family came and paid substantial attorney fees. Her family is paying her medical bills. Her family is bringing her food, taking care of her, taking her where she needs to go. In the end, the defense decided not to call Julia to testify. Now in her 70s, they said she was suffering from dementia. And if her behavior towards reporters outside the courthouse was any indication of how she'd be on the stand... You know that right now. It was too big a gamble. After seven days of testimony, both sides rested. By the end of the trial, the question was not, is she involved? But how could she not be involved? The jury took less than four hours to reach a verdict. We're all sitting around, and everybody's kind of yeah. just killing time. Then Bailey comes out and says, the jury, a verdict's been reached. Did your heart though just kind of, I thought I was going to throw up. I was almost hyperventilating. Melvin's granddaughter wasn't in the courtroom with the rest of her family when the verdict was read. Her dad called her with the news. And he called me and said, she's guilty, murder. Julia Phillips, the Belle of York, was now a convicted killer. I was jumping up and down. I remember waking up the next morning and there was double rainbows. And I just thought, this is, this is awesome. Julia has been called an ice queen, a femme fatale, cunning, greedy, murderous woman. Yes, it's not really what comes to mind when you just look at her. Right. When you look at her, you think, oh, she's an attractive older lady. And then she opens her mouth and you can see what's really in there. Julia's arrest for Melvin Roberts murder triggered more legal questions for the Southern Belle. Julia's stepdaughters from a previous marriage believe she didn't just murder one man, but two. My father's not here because of her as well. The daughters insist their father, Brian Phillips, didn't die of a heart attack. They think Julia poisoned him. When the daughters heard about Julia's arrest, they took their suspicions to county coroner Dennis Fowler. There was enough suspicion that was presented to me that I ordered the body exempt. Were there concerns revolving around Julia Phillips? There were concerns. Julia denied she killed him and was not charged in that case. Three years after her conviction, in 2016, Julia died in prison. She was 72. For the family, that wasn't the end. Ronnie says the investigation is far from closed. Now, we gotta go after the next one. The family believes there's a hitman still out there and is offering a $10,000...
Ryan here, guest hosting today. If you want to learn how to take real, lasting climate action like I do, I want to invite you to join Countdown, TED's new global initiative to accelerate solutions to the climate crisis. Now, here's a conversation from the Countdown Global Launch Event between engineer and developers. The sources are everywhere, and the impacts are everywhere, although obviously some nations have contributed much more than others. In fact, one of the terrible things about climate change is those who contributed least to it will be hurt the most. It's a great inequity machine. So here we have a problem that you cannot solve within the national boundaries of one country, uh, and yet international institutions are notoriously weak. So that's part of the wicked problem. The second element of the wicked problem is it transcends normal timescales. We're used to news day by day or quarterly reports for business enterprises or an election cycle. It's not the longest we think anymore. Climate change essentially lasts forever. When you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's there or its impacts are there for a thousand years. It's a gift we keep on giving for our children, our grandchildren, and dozens and dozens of generations. Of young. It sounds like a tax we keep on paying. Yeah, it is. It is. You sin once, you pay forever. And then the third element of it being a wicked problem is that carbon dioxide is embedded in every aspect of our industrial economy. Every car and every truck and every airplane and every house and every electrical socket and every industrial process now emits carbon dioxide. So what's the recipe? Well, here's the shortcut. If you decarbonize the grid, the electrical grid, and then run everything on electricity, decarbonize the grid and electrify it. If you do those two things, you have a zero carbon economy. Now that would seem like a pipe dream just a few years ago because it was expensive to create a zero carbon grid. But the prices of solar and wind have plummeted. Solar is now the cheapest form of electricity on planet Earth and wind is second. It means now that you can convert the grid to zero carbon rapidly and save consumers money along the way. So there's leverage. Well, I think a key question now is do we have the technology that we need to replace fossil fuels to get this job done? My answer is no. I think we're about 70, maybe 80 percent of the way there. For example, we urgently need a breakthrough in batteries. Our batteries need to be higher energy density. They need to have enhanced safety, faster charging. They need to take less space and less weight. Above all else, they need to cost a lot less. In fact, we need new chemistries that don't rely on scarce cobalt. And we're going to need lots of these batteries. We desperately need much more research in clean energy technology. The U.S. invests about two and a half billion dollars a year. Do you know how much Americans spend on potato chips? The answer is four billion dollars. Now, what do you think of that? Upside down. But let me press a little further on a question that's fascinating about the Silicon Valley. So the Silicon Valley is governed by Moore's law, where performance doubles every 18 months. It's not really a 